Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight on our news. The Prime Minister announces stiff immigration measures in the House of Assembly. We're in a shanty town to speak with those who will probably be most affected by this new policy. Leader of the opposition, Philip Brave Davis, is categorically denying that the Christie administration used $42 million of hurricane money to attempt to buy the last election. Family members of Eugene Woodside gather with their church for a candlelight vigil. Our news is brought to you by Alive the nation's newest and best LTE network. Good to be alive. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Vonnie Tude. Topping news tonight, get out or be kicked out. That's the warning being sent to illegal migrants living in the Bahamas. Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Min is telling Parliament today that illegal migrants have until the end of the year to leave. Min is also hit out at the Progressive Liberal Party, which he accused of laying the foundation for high levels of crime currently taking place. Jasmine Brown reports. While he did not elaborate on the details, the Prime Minister made it clear that anyone living in the Bahamas illegally must get out. Those migrants who are here illegally must leave by December 31st, 2017. After which, they will be aggressively pursued and deported. This applies, Mr. Speaker, to all nationalities. And it's not just the illegal migrants who were given a deadline. Minutes said Bahamians who employ illegal migrants have until December 31st to regularize them. Those Bahamians and residents who employ illegal migrants have until December 31st, 2017 yep. to regularize these individuals or stop employing them. I implore immigration officers to execute their duties in a professional and humane manner. Those who are illegally, those who illegally employ such migrants are legally liable and they will be prosecuted. As for those who are legally entitled to status, the Prime Minister says his administration will do all it can to ensure that happens. He insisted the Bahamas must be a country of law and order and charged that the Progressive Liberal Party laid the foundation for much of the crime happening now in the country because it tolerated massive corruption. Some of them got in bed with international drug traffickers who were allowed to set up shop on our islands, shipping untold millions of dollars worth of poison to North America. Some of the poison stayed here bringing ruin to many young and promising Bahamians. Some PLPs get extremely rich, got extremely rich in this illicit trade. Minis insisted it's a practice that has helped foster crime for decades, starting with the drug trade in the 1980s. The party that was charged with making this nation great perverted it. Today, our streets are violent. Yes. Our education standards are low. Yes. Corruption is a way of life for too many, especially those who have gotten away with their corrupt ways for decades. Yep. But, Mr. Speaker, this is a new day. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Well, minutes after the Prime Minister's warning to illegal migrants, our Kyle Joaquin visited several shanty towns today where he spoke with persons who could be impacted by this policy. I'm in an area known as The Village. It's located in a shanty town just off of Cowpen Road. Now, this place is home to both Haitian nationals as well as Bahamians, all wondering how this new policy is going to affect them. Karen Xavier is a Bahamian who lives in this shanty town just off Cowpen Road. She says her husband once lived with the fear of deportation. Yeah, he is straight now, though. Okay. But um, some people, they're going through very hard time, and it hurt my feelings to see it you, like that way. You live here with your family? Um, yeah, my husband and my two children. 
As if living in this area isn't hard enough, Xavier says it's unfair for illegal migrants to be given a deadline of December 31st. December 31st, that's, that's a long, that's two months. Yeah, that's two months, but some people, they can't find it and stuff like that. They can't find no boss and stuff to put the papers in for them. That's the problem. They want to be straight, but that's the situation. You think this is going to affect a lot of families? Yeah, it is, because it affected mine. Because I had to raise up my son for like 10 years with all his daddy there. Karen introduced us to her husband, where despite the language barrier, he explained that after dealing with the headache of a work permit, he finally got his papers. They asked me what I name. I, I say my name is Fishnell. So after that, he said, I need rocket police, police rocket, and card sentry, and two pictures. After that, they put my work permit in. Mm -hmm. After that, they come in out. Mm -hmm. I say, thank, thank God for yeah. that. All right. But now you, you live here with your family. You, you happy? Yes, sir. I'm happy. That's my wife. Wait a I got married from the Bahamas. <laughs> Good for me. Karen walked us through the little community with clapboard houses and clothes hanging outside in the rain. As we made our way through, she'd stop and explain the new policy to those in the area. Many unwilling to talk on camera, but obviously concerned about what the future will bring. <laughs> Eventually, we ran into this woman by the name of Mary, another Haitian national, lying on the floor right by her door. She didn't know about the prime minister's deadline until we told her. Okay. Um, she said that um, like some people, they would like to get straight, but sometimes they put their papers in and then the immigration people, like it's not easy for it to come out. They either deny them or something. And she said even her, she went to renew her papers. And um, it's been three months now. Um, it hasn't come out as yet. And through Karen, who served as our translator, we asked if she lives in fear that one day immigration could send her or her loved ones back to Haiti. Okay. She says she isn't really scared, but um, if immigration take um, her or them and then deport them, then they're going back to their country because this is not their country. So. Um, she does have to live with whatever comes her way. Karen says most of the people in this tiny community live here legally and are just looking for a job. But there is now the concern about what will happen to the many families now in jeopardy of being separated as a result of this new policy. For our news, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Opposition leader Philip Brave Davis is denying suggestions that $42 million of hurricane money was used in an attempt to buy the recent general election. Jared Higgs has that. Leader of the opposition, Philip Brave Davis, says allegations that the former government used millions of dollars borrowed for hurricane relief to buy an election win are completely false. He was responding to Deputy Prime Minister Peter Turnquist, who suggested yesterday that the Christie administration diverted more than $40 million of the $150 million borrowed for hurricane relief last year. Turnquist said the money was likely used on cronies and other wasteful spending. The Cat Island, Rum Key, and San Salvador MP attempted to rise on a point of privilege in Parliament today, but was shut down by the House Speaker. He later addressed the matter outside the House of Assembly. The message that they were sending um, through the irresponsible public utterances of the Minister of Finance is that we misappropriate funds, diverted them for the use for which they were not intended, and that is an egregious, uh, an egregious assault on the integrity, particularly my integrity and the integrity of all of those of us who would have served around the cabinet table. Davis says some of those former ministers are consulting with attorneys to determine whether they will take legal action. Um, I'm certain and being advised that some of my colleagues are now seeking legal advice because the effect of him being able to say that we took 45, 44 million dollars or 42 million dollars to buy an election, that suggests we have committed a criminal offense. That's what he's saying. And it cannot just be left on, on the, in the minds of the Bahamian people and in the public as such. Mr. Davis says it's comments like these that cause the international community to lose faith in the country. That then leads to potential downgrades and suggestions for increases in taxes. How then is he arriving at the conclusion that $42 million, $42 million was used for the purpose of buying the election? What are the particulars of, of what particulars are you looking at that he's looking at to inform that view? 
Right? It's irresponsible. He's the Minister of Finance. Right? That, that is why we are having some of the challenges from the international observers today, because of these, these continual uh, irresponsible utterances where he talked down the economy. The former Deputy Prime Minister says he intends to raise the matter as a breach of his parliamentary privilege during the next sitting of the House of Assembly. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. After much prodding from the opposition, the Prime Minister tabled the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility document that indicates the Bahamas lost out on $31.8 million in insurance payouts after Hurricane Matthew. Mr. Speaker, you know, you know what that $32 million could have done for Grand Bahama or the rest of Bahamas? Of the document dated May 31st, 2017, the payout would have been the single largest payout ever made by the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. The policy was canceled under the last Christie administration. Opposition leader Philip Davis, who had asked that it be tabled, asked that even more documents be tabled. I wonder whether he'll also lay on the table the advice that was given by the committee to the PLP cabinet and the advice that was given to yourselves just before you would have uh, renewed the, 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 uh, the insurance. Minis also announced that his government is pushing for the Bahamas to be divided into three zones. Gunman shot and killed a woman and left two men in serious condition during a shooting incident on Pearedale and Raymond Roads last night. Chief Superintendent Solomon Cash of the Central Detective Unit says police received reports of the triple shooting shortly after 9 p.m. He says the woman died on the scene while the men were transported to hospital. Those individuals were standing here on the corner and a white Japanese vehicle pulled up. Um, lone gunman emerged, opened fire on three victims. Uh, which uh, fatally shot one and the other two are uh, critically injured. The father of eight-year-old Eugene Woodside was brought to tears last night as he pleaded with parents to keep their children close. His emotional tribute to his son came during a candlelight vigil at the family's church. April Sands was there. Family members of Eugene Woodside gather with their church for a candlelight vigil. Jesus, Jesus, Weeks after eight-year-old Eugene Woodside's young life was cut tragically short, his grieving relatives packed Holy Trinity AME Zion last night for a candlelight vigil. The Albury sales student was inside his Rosebud Street home doing his homework when he was hit by a bullet intended for another person. Eugene's father also fought back tears as he recalled memories of his son. Please, every day, every chance you all get, just please tell your children how much you all love them. Just please, and at the end of the night, if you all just could hug them and kiss them, please, yeah, because they're so special and you don't know when they're going away from you. And I just hope my son bring a change somewhere. I don't know what it is yet, but it might be coming soon. Yes, sir. But again, thanks a lot. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With her husband by her side, the child's heartbroken mother, Kendera Woodside, made a plea to parents to keep their children close. If y'all love your kids, hold them as close as y'all could possibly hold them. Because I really thought my baby was safe home with me. So... <laughs> And as she prepares to bury her only son, Woodside said the past few weeks have been tough. I try all up as much as I could tonight because I know what in my heart, my baby going straight to heaven. Amen. But trust in me, the little bit of time, because no one knows the time nor the hour, y'all cherish it to the fullest. It's life short. Family members also came out last night to show their support. A lot of the young fellas nowadays need to find God. But I have an eight-year-old son myself, so, you know, I just can imagine the pain she's going through. She has my support 100%. Singing songs of hope and holding hands in prayer, his loved ones called for the country to stand together against crime. I've come! to call awareness in lighting a candle for Eugene to let this nation know that enough is enough. Eugene's funeral will be held this Friday at 11 a.m. 
at Holy Trinity AME Zion Church. Reporting for our news, I'm April Sands. What a sad story. Still to come, find out how much a government unit paid in rent each year. That's after the break.